Today is the first Sunday of Lent, the Sunday of Orthodoxy. On this day, the year 842 AD, the Empress Saint Theodora restored icons. Now, as we know, in the 8th century, under the iconoclasts, the uh, emperor, uh, emperors Leo and Constantine uh, stopped the veneration of icons. They were under the impression that the military defeats that the Roman Empire in the East was suffering was on account of icons. They had been influenced by certain uh, Islamic and Jewish uh, teachings on images. And so they ordered that all of the icons would be removed and destroyed. This, of course, caused a great turmoil in the empire and throughout the church. Many of the people and bishops in the area of Constantinople succumbed to this heresy because the emperor having his troops with swords at your neck, people tend to fall away. Now, of course, that's not an excuse because there were many people who did not fall away. Many people hid their icons. Uh, we know this because on the Sunday of Orthodoxy, when or icons were finally restored once and for all, the people came out in the street with the icons that they had been hiding uh, and carried them in procession. And uh, from that point on, every uh, first Sunday of Lent, from that time of 842 till today, we of course remember the restoration of the icons. And we call it the Sunday of Orthodoxy because this is the restoration of the true faith. So in every time, there is going to be people that challenge the true faith. And we know that um, we know that in this day especially, it is common that instead of challenging the true faith with an alternative faith, it's very common that people uh, challenge the faith in the very presupposition of faith itself, saying that it doesn't really matter what you believe um, as long as you're a good person. But we know that from orthodox, what does orthodoxy mean? We, we tend to think of orthodoxy as meaning the right faith which is, is, is certainly one of the connotations of the word, but the word actually means right worship, right glory, or tho doxa, doxa means glory. And the reason is that what you pray is what you believe. That's an ancient maxim of the church, uh, found in many of the patristic writings of the past. So the way that we worship and the way that we pray is the way that we believe, and this has, this, so the two are linked. I like to always say that if you don't know where you're going, if you don't have a map, you're not going to get to your destination. Or if out of some fortune you do arrive, it's after taking a very circuitous route, after getting lost and being very late. And so, in other words, the destination is, of course, Christ. We want to be with Christ. We want to have a relationship with Christ God. We want to have communion with him. We want to grow. If we don't know who he is, how can we do that? So people that uh, claim that all of the different beliefs, it doesn't really matter what you believe, all paths lead to God, well, you know, does that bear out an experience? And of course, the people that usually say such things usually are not having the most stable life, usually are floundering or uh, can't seem to make sense of things. So the point being that what you believe has a direct impact on how you live and how your life is, how you pray, and it all is connected. So that's why the Orthodox Church insists on on showing and demonstrating the correct teachings of the faith and, and even saying that the Orthodox Church alone is the true Church of Christ. So it's something that often gets the ire of our friends, neighbors, and family when we say such a thing. How could we say that the Orthodox Church is the true Church and that the other churches by extension are not the true Church? Well, it does matter because Christ came to earth to free men of error. He gave these teachings not just as an intellectual exercise, but these teachings that were passed down from Christ and the Apostles are simply the truth. They're the true way that which man finds salvation. If we're not fasting, if we're not praying, if we're not uh, reading scriptures, if we're not coming to liturgy and to fellowship with other Christians, then we're not finding the cure of our soul. Uh, this, All of these teachings, all of this worship has the direct impact of leading us to a better life, of a more healthy life, of a holy life, and ultimately of communion with God. So when we, when we claim that, uh, you know, anyone that claims that, well, how can you say that orthodoxy is the true faith, they're, they're kind of doubting Christ, because if Christ says that I am the way, I am the truth, uh, and no one comes to the Father except by me, do we really imagine that he wouldn't have left 
a very specific way of carrying on in his footsteps. And of course we know he did. It's evident in the scriptures. And anyone that reads the, the fathers after the New Testament sees that that very same pattern was passed down. Of course we know it's through apostolic succession. The, the uh, bishops uh, entrusting the faith to the next generation of bishops on and on from time immemorial. That's a confirmation, an external confirmation of the true faith. Now, of course, um, as, a, as I could say as, a, as a, a footnote, that the Orthodox do not have the same kind of view of apostolic succession as uh, is common, for instance, the Roman Catholic Church, that says that if you have the right minister, the right form, that you say the right words, you have the right intent, and the person being ordained is a baptized male, um, then you say the prayers, and that person's ordained. Even if you yourself are in schism, or if you go into schism, you're still a bishop. And that's why there's all these breakaway churches that still claim to be Catholic churches and have apostolic succession. And the Roman Catholic Church often recognizes that, well, they're in schism, but they, um, you know, have apostolic succession. That's because they've taken this teaching and distilled it down to its most legalistic framework. The reason we have apostolic succession is to guarantee the faith. So apostolic succession was a guarantee that someone had come to become the leader in a local community, had preached the right faith, and as a result, he was then approved by his neighboring churches and the neighboring heads of those churches, the other bishops, laid their hands on him as a confirmation. Of course, that did convey the Holy Spirit. We know that from Scripture, that when Christ gave his apostles the, uh, the power to not only forgive sins, but to bind them, thus implying that they were confessing to the, the apostles, because if you didn't know what the person did, then how would you know whether to bind or loose the sin, of course, but Christ breathed on them. He laid, and then, of course, in the uh, Acts, when the apostles made deacons, they laid hands on them. So we know that the Spirit was transmitted through the act, but the act itself is not the only focus. The main focus is preserving the faith. And if, if we leave the church and go out of the church, then we lose that, that communion with God we, we, lose, we leave the, the, the community of the faith, and we lose apostolic succession. And that's why the Orthodox Church can confidently say it's the true church, because only the Orthodox Church has apostolic succession, that physical laying on of hands, and has proven to not change by adding or subtracting anything to the true faith. We know that in the Western churches, the Roman Catholic Church added teachings to the apostolic faith, and then the Protestants, noticing that things had gone awry, trying to turn the clock back, turned it back in the wrong direction, went too far, invented their own teachings. So Orthodoxy has always had that balance from the beginning. Now, one thing I'll say, because it's Lent, so we've all had one week of Lent so far, so we're probably all tired, probably a little cranky, you know, it's, it's hard to start fasting. It's, uh, it's, it's really a struggle sometimes. Let's not forget that sometimes the benefit and the blessing is in the struggle, not just in the result, not just in the accomplishment, but in the process. Every step of the way, every struggle, God hears our cries of, of uh, desperation, our struggles, our, our, our longing. He feels the longing in our hearts. And even when we don't um, do, our, our, do, our, do everything, when we try as best as we can and we fall, God knows that we're trying. So if we make a mistake during Lent, Let's just pick ourselves up and get back in it. One very uh, easy way to undo your Lenten observance is, for instance, practical example. It's um, a weekday during Lent, and uh, you have the wrong kind of food. You just you're at lunch with your friends at work, and you know it's pressure, and you eat the wrong thing. Okay, you sinned. Um, you missed out on the fast. Do you go home then and say, well, you know, I already broke the fast today. I might as well live it up. No. Go back to fasting. Don't ever get in the habit of saying that I already can, I already broke the fast. Oh, I didn't say my prayers this morning. Well, I'm, I'm already out. I might as well not say it tonight. I'll just get a good start tomorrow. No. No, no, no. Make sure that as soon as you realize that you've fallen, just get back up. Christ is standing there to, to lift you up if you just look. If you don't stretch out your hand and you don't look at the Master, then you won't see his hand, which is already in your face. Let's remember that he comes and calls us at at various times. We know from the Gospel uh, of Mark, he called uh, Simon when, uh, when he was fishing. Um, he called Nathaniel, who was sitting, as you heard in the Gospel today, uh, under the, the fig tree. We hear about how 
Moses realized at a certain time, it said in that, that wonderful epistle reading from Hebrews, that he, didn't, he no longer could, could stand, I believe the expression was something like, the season of sin. Uh, he, did not, he did not want to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter anymore. So God comes and calls us in various states, whether we're high, whether we're low. We don't know when God is going to ask us to do something, but when he does ask us to do it, let's be ready. And how are we ready? With a pure heart. How do we have a pure heart? By overcoming passions. How do we overcome passions? By prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. Almost every sermon I give, I always talk about prayer, fasting, and almsgiving because it's the most simple concept, and it's also the hardest thing for us to do. And so we say it over and over again to make sure it gets stuck in our head that we have to pray, we have to fast, and we have to give alms. And that just means charity in general, too. Be charitable and love. It has to be done in love and forgiveness. Because if we don't have love, then it's all for naught. So let's prepare. Uh, and when Christ does call us, he may call us to different things. He may call us. Our calling in life might be to raise a family. Our calling in life may be to uh, go and teach the nations as an evangelist, as a missionary. Our calling may be to... Uh, Suffer martyrdom. That still happens in this day and age. Our calling may be to be ordained. Our calling may be monasticism. Or we may not know our calling yet. We may be praying and asking God to help show us the way. But what we do know is that if we're fasting, praying, living the life of the church, and coming to fellowship, then we'll hear that voice of God at the right time. So let's make sure we're prepared. Let's make sure that we don't pass him by uh, when he's reaching out to us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat>